All right, so I'd like to welcome our next group up. Uh, Peter Evans, who's Vice President of the Center for Global Enterprise. Mike Kaplan is Vice President of Marketing at Retroefficiency. And Eric Graham is co-founder, CEO of Crowd Comfort. And they'll be talking about energy's data revolution. And I think that's going to be a very interesting topic because it'll talk about adding a data layer on top of one of the older industries that humans are uh, engaged in. Thanks very much. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, I attended last year, and I thought it was a fantastic uh, conference, so it's, uh, it's a pleasure and uh, an honor to be uh, invited to speak. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I uh, am the Vice President of the Center for Global Enterprise, which is a new think tank that's just been established last year by the former CEO of IBM. Um, and it looks at the globalization, um, transformation of the firm, and one of the projects that we're going to look at is the globalization of platforms. We've been speaking about platforms very much as domestic phenomenon, but increasingly platforms are emerging as global players as well. Um, haven't done that research completely yet, so today I'm going to talk about um, platforms in the energy space. Um, I used to lead a global strategy for GE's energy business, and I got really excited about platforms, a lot of attention to them, but when you looked in the energy space, you didn't find very many platforms. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why that may be the case and why that may be uh, changing. Um, a lot of it centers around the challenge of information, and just to refresh your kind of basic uh, economics on information, when you have a lack of information, you lead to all sorts of market failures. And what we're seeing a lot of platforms doing is solving those types of market failures. One, just um, not having sufficient information, so the platforms serve that role of, of matching and, and providing greater information. Um, the other may be asymmetric information, one party having more information than the other and uh, that can lead to all sorts of problems. And it turns out the energy space is rife with these problems. Um, anybody here know what this is? This is actually the control room at Chernobyl. So you can see the challenges <laughs> associated with what do you do with that? And I tell you, if you go to industrial facilities, um, usually a little bit better than this, but not far off, so that, that point about human-centered design, how do you interface with machines, and the um, energy space is a huge space, so I'm going to walk through some of the, some stats on that just to give you a, a sense, but fundamentally you have this problem of when you have information scarcity, um, you have very high transaction costs, so it's expensive to do things, um, actions tend to be reactive rather than uh, something else, and you're subject to, to errors. I think what we're doing, we're seeing now is a ch transformation, and that's why I'm excited about the potential for platforms to emerge in the energy space, is that we're seeing this rise of more information, which allows you to reduce transaction costs, to be more predictive um, in how you address uh, the energy space, and to reduce the amount of errors that are associated with things like uh, Chernobyl. Um, and it's introducing a new set of dynamics as you see more sensors being deployed, more information being grabbed. The volume and velocity of data is growing, and this is happening at multiple levels. It's happening at the machine level, it's happening at the facility level, and big complex energy systems are an assemblage of many, many machines. Then you're talking about the fleet level, so you can have a whole set of fleets of um, different types of um, energy-related facilities. So one pipeline network, for example, will have compressors up and down that uh, pipeline. So it's, a, it's a, basically a fleet of uh, machinery that runs that network. And then you get up to the network level and lots of information associated with managing uh, power grids, trans, uh, um, gas grids, and oil, uh, and other types of moving energy around. Um, expanded monitoring and automation, really big deal. You're able to uh, collect information, monitor assets in, in new ways. Again, a shift from reactive, uh, where you gather that data, process it, and then made your reaction to more predictive analytics. And then the rise of matching platforms in the energy space and the experimentation with app stores, which is uh, quite interesting. So before I talk about some of these examples, I just want to 
um, impress upon you the size and scale of the energy space. So just in the United States, the energy, um, just the electricity bill for America is uh, 30, uh, $364 billion a year. So it's a very large space. Um, the housing stock of the United States is uh, 125 million uh, units. Then you have commercial buildings, which are very large, like this building and behind us, all of those facilities. There are five million of those buildings. And then you get into the very large industrial facilities like refineries, uh, power plants, and things of that nature. And you're talking about 350,000 of those. So the inner space is extremely large. So the question is, why don't we see more platforms in this space um, active? And just to give you a sense of the amount of power plants, these are thermal power plants. So the center in blue there would be all of the gas-fired power plants in the United States. The brown around the outside are the coal-fired power plants, and then the red are the uh, nuclear plants, and the uh, light gray are the oil-fired power plants, which we still have as largely as peakers. So you're talking there of um, almost 12,000 of these power plants that run the U.S. economy. So there's a lot of... Um, um, assets out there and to service this fleet, that is like you would in a car, taking your car to garage, these things have to be serviced. Uh, we calculated it's about 12 million man hours a year just to service this fleet. So there's tremendous amount of uh, activity that's involved just in keep maintaining that, that asset base. And then you move to uh, buildings, as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of them out there and they consume about 40% of U.S. energy consumption. So the asset base of the buildings themselves is quite significant. And the question is, how do we improve that with the new information streams? How do we take advantage of those? So data is critical, and there's a variety of sources of data. And they have a whole range of challenges associated with obtaining that information. You've got the utilities themselves. And the United States tend to be a very fragmented energy market. There are more than 3,000 utilities in the United States. So you're dealing with a lot of entities when you try to get in this space. Um, obviously, industrial facilities. Um, then you have commercial and then down to the residential. So lots of attention to uh, nest and what's going to happen in the home. But I tell you, if you want to really tackle the energy problem, that's not necessarily where all the action is. There's a lot of other uh, areas there. And then there are the different devices that you can use, from meters to thermostats to other kinds of sensors. Um, and what's interesting as well, even people can be sensors, which we'll hear uh, more about. So I'm going to talk about two kinds of platforms. One are supply-side platforms. In the solar space, lots of people focus on the reduction in cost of um, the uh, solar panels themselves. But actually, there's been a lot of innovation around the information associated with deploying solar and then the matching functions that you can organize and rationalize. So for example, obviously, this all happened in San Francisco because they were watching what else was going on. They, they figured out that, oh, you can grab satellite imaging data. You can then build a way of detecting the angle of a particular home. And uh, you can create a portal where people would submit um, requests for um, pricing on obtaining that. And so they've set up these matching systems where homeowners can uh, submit um, their location. And in within 24 hours, that information is then collected to prepare a firm quote over the internet. You never have to go to that facility, so you eliminate all the truck rolls. And these companies aren't beholden to particular panel suppliers, so they can have that side of the market compete. And on the other side of the market, the installers, they're also not beholden to any particular installer, so they can aggregate that part of the market, and the financing. So they're basically bringing all of these pieces together to create new business models. And these are the fastest and most profitable solar companies in the United States uh, right now are these matching uh, platforms. So interesting things happening on the supply side. And then on the demand side, which is how do you reduce energy, not necessarily provide new energy sources, which is um, <clears throat> companies which have been around for a long time, like Johnson Controls, which is a big company, tends to be more of a B2B company, so you don't hear about it in the media as much unless you happen to be reading the uh, energy trade press. But they're experimenting with things like app stores, um, which are looking at a variety of different ways because they've got a lot of installed equipment and control systems in these buildings. And so they're coming up with new um, 
APIs and a way to organize this emerging ecosystem in this space to do a bunch of different things, which is to pinpoint equipment that's wasting energy, um, to um, monitor and report, and uh, most big companies have energy managers, so this is a way to flow that information to the energy managers in a new, uh, more efficient manner. So if you look now, um, this is a map I built on the emergence of new startups in this space. And uh, there may be more, I've got 22 on here. And so these are companies that have started up since 2003 or so, so over the last decade. So you don't see this rapid explosion as we do in some of the social media spaces. We see little pockets, there's a lot of activity up here in the uh, New England area. Um, some stuff happening out in California. We see a few spin-offs, actually, uh, ex-Microsoft um, folks up in the uh, north, north uh, west, and a few down in Texas, and even in Atlanta uh, as well. So we're seeing the beginnings of these uh, companies, and they're basically kind of what I call energy intelligence companies, where they're collecting new sources of data, processing that data, and then providing it back to a variety of different users. And today we're going to hear um, two examples of these emerging companies and I'll introduce them in a second. But before I do that, I just wanted to throw out a, f um, a couple of key strategic questions, which is where are the opportunities the greatest for platform companies to grow in an industrial space like energy? Um, <clears throat> what are, and then what are the network effects, if any, that exist in this space? Because you need those network effects to get the platforms up and that value of the platforms. And then finally, are there regulatory impediments? You can imagine uh, we're hearing a lot of news about Uber and some of its challenges in getting into markets. Um, in, the, in these big industrial spaces, they're very entrenched incumbents. They tend to be heavily regulated industries. So what does that regulatory landscape mean for the rise of new platform plays? So with that, let me turn it to uh, my, uh, <clears throat> my panelists. And first, I'd like to introduce uh, Mike. Kaplan, who is the Vice President for Marketing at Retroefficiency, and I think when you hear his presentation, it will change your view of the potential for energy efficiency in, in the industrial space. So, wait, welcome, Mike. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Thanks. Um, should be in there. Missing presentation. Not a good start. So I do have to disagree with one thing that uh, Brian said. If you talk to any Uber loyalists, they will tell you that it is, in fact, the greatest taxi ride that they've taken. Um, that narrative is changing, though, with UberX, which people are now saying is the strangest taxi ride they've ever taken, if you've done that. But, um, I am also going to talk about the sexy topic of buildings, um, which Peter touched on, and Eric will as well in some capacity. Uh, as Peter said, um, buildings do consume 40% of our energy, but the, the other piece of that is that 30 to 50% of that energy is um, routinely wasted um, and it could be cost effectively saved. So when we think about things like climate change and warming, which is no longer a question really of will it have an impact, but how much of an impact will it have, um, buildings are a very, very important I'll, I'll wait, but, okay, just gonna go, I, okay. Nope. That's, yeah. Imagine a, a great slide behind you. Um, I can quickly email, but it's, it's okay. All right, we'll run without it. <laughs> I, I, yep, I can grab it. Let me do that. I won't say the same joke again then. Okay. Great. Technology works. So this is Eric Graham with uh, Crowd Comfort, who's the founder and CEO of, uh, I think, a really interesting and innovative company. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. And uh, when Peter first reached out to me, 
talking about this conference, I, you know, I was intrigued immediately, but you know, as a one-year-old company, really trying to help people in buildings um, take things that they care about and get them to the people that need to react to those things. Um, I hadn't really been thinking about this as a platform, to be honest, and so I'm really interested in learning from this group and hearing what you think about us as a platform and how we're evolving. I think we are in the early stages of developing this new platform that does exactly that. It takes geolocated data from people with their smartphones and it delivers it to people in buildings that, need to, that can react and fix things, and that helps to build a really interesting environment for data and, and analytics and decision making. I'm beating a dead horse here talking about the 40% of energy going into US buildings today, but it is a big problem and many of you have seen probably this, this graphic that shows the energy flows and where it, it goes to and this is obviously the biggest sector of energy consumption. When we talk about buildings, they are a very complex system. There's mechanical systems, there's an external environment, there's an enclosure around the building, there's services coming into the building, and then there's the biggest challenge, which is people. And you can design the greatest LEED certified building, and when you're done, you think it's gonna be the best of the best, and you add people to the mix, and they tend to screw everything up. Um, and that's a, that's a challenge, but in today's world, we have new opportunities. It, one of the things that, you know, I started thinking about when, when you think about the Internet of Things and connecting equipment to, with smart devices to make them intelligent, you start to wonder, well, it, you know, are we making humans obsolete? Are we, you know, are we taking, you know, the system's taking over the world? And to some extent, in buildings, we've kind of let the system take over, and this is the problem that I think in part we're solving on the comfort side. Today, um, comfort is treated as a complaint. Someone giving feedback about the way they feel in a building is treated as a complaint, which means not a lot of people will do it because they don't want to complain at work. Um, or they're, they're only, you know, you're getting a limited data set of information. Uh, when someone does make a report, the facility manager 90% of the time will basically go to the system and say, well, the system says 72 degrees, so why are you complaining? Um, so this human feedback is actually discarded in today's world. And I think this is an important problem because when you, when you look at, and this is a study that was done by LBNL that took uh, 10 different research studies on the combination of comfort and productivity. And as you see on the left-hand side, for every one degree C, there's about a 2% change in comfort, uh, in productivity outside of the comfort zone. So, and when you translate this to Fahrenheit, uh, for us Americans, uh, it's about a 1.1% drop in productivity. So, to some extent, when someone's saying, um, you know, I'm uncomfortable, it's highly unlikely that what they're really saying is, I'm being unproductive. And if you went to your boss and said, I'm being unproductive today, they would say, well, how can I help you be more productive? But in today's world, they don't do that. Um, so I took GE, one of our customers that we're working with, uh, in our beta phase, they have 300,000 employees. You know, if there was a 1% loss in productivity and that impacted 10% of their employees, it would be about a $20 million loss in profit per degree Fahrenheit, or about $150 million in revenue. And if you extrapolated that, thanks Peter for this great graphic, um, but if you extrapolate that across the 500 largest companies, it's a $4 billion loss in profit per degree Fahrenheit. So why can't occupants have more control? I mean, if they did, we could have actionable data with a historical record that leads to better decision making and provides this continuous process knowledge, improving employees' comfort and productivity, maybe happiness even. Um, so what we faced when we, when we started bringing this um, technology to market and talking to the folks that manage buildings we kept hearing about this disconnect in communication between these two parties. And I think when you talk about platforms, it's often a platform's bringing two, two pieces of information together um, and connecting people in many ways. Um, Google does that with search, obviously. You know, someone's searching for something, they bring someone who can deliver that to them. Um, and with occupants, often in buildings, we don't know who to report to, or again, it's treated in a way that doesn't encourage you to report, or there's a complex system that you have to put information into. 
So you're not being able to really, you're not being encouraged to unlock this human capability that we have of all of our senses and delivering that information seamlessly. And this creates problems for the facilities managers. They're in a, in a difficult situation when it comes to comfort because of the way the systems are designed and you know, antiquated systems didn't allow for um, new ways of thinking, but mobile technology allows this to happen, provide operational efficiency opportunities and energy. So what we do is we create an application and one of the first things we did was, was work on how do we specifically know where somebody is when they're making a report because it, it's not that helpful to just get reports if they're all over the place and you can't map them to where they are. So we focused on what are the technologies that could let us do that and settled on a QR code methodology that's extremely simple, non-mechanical, but does unlock these human sensor uh, networks and buildings. And we, we allow people to report on comfort and our ability to re report geolocated information led to other requests for, hey, could occupants report on slip hazards somewhere or light bulbs out or maybe there's, there's, there's no coffee or milk in the refrigerator. Um, so we created the ability to just take a picture attach some text and send it to, into the internet and we would deliver it to who needed to, re, to react to that. And then we added, um, based on requests from customers, the ability to track environmental compliance reporting with a basic checklist, geolocated timestamp, helping to improve the information flow in the regulatory environment. And all of our reporting just starts with this geolocated timestamp report, whether it's a, a checklist and an environmental compliance report or a comfort report, and it goes directly to folks that can react in a mobile device. And they can change or assign the task or change the status. It goes in the cloud and we can provide analytics that provide useful feedback, and I'll show you what that looks like, and, and measure performance. So we create this one solution that helps to distill what's going on in this world that people don't quite understand how to ease of, of delivering information into one communications strategy. So it sounds simple, and it, and it is, but I think we may have found a way to change the way people and buildings interact forever. And what I can show you is some of the, the data we've collected. This is Enernox headquarters. They were one of our first alpha sites. And we've um, uncovered many situations like the red circle right next to a blue circle. This is uh, pie charts that sh demonstrate the larger circles show more people reporting and in what direction red is hot. Um, blue is cold. And um, you can see that this is a simple system imbalance that can be solved. Providing this information allows the facility manager to focus on where they can save energy and help people feel more comfortable, hopefully being more productive as well. And I get, we do get the question all the time, do we have, well, don't we have, you know, someone feels hot and someone feels cold? And you know, you see circles like this one, yeah. Absolutely we do. And um, that's not maybe a place where action is needed to, to be taken, but obviously a red circle next to a blue, there's obviously action that can be taken. One of the things we noted in, in September uh, last year, there was a heat wave. So one of the first weeks that we were installed at Enroc, and we noted almost immediately that we were getting differences in reporting by floor. So the fourth floor was much colder. You can see the blue slice, then the fifth, and then again, then the sixth floor. So it was, there was a thermocline effect that we were picking up from the human sensor reporting that we were getting. And it was very interesting, but we didn't quite know exactly what was going on. And we could imagine they have open uh, stairwells between floors. This is the elevator bank where you come in, there's a big reception area, and there's a large open stairwell. And this is our more recent report, and you can almost visualize there's a wall on the right side of that stairwell and it, the stair turns left. You can almost visualize the air coming down from the fifth floor and cooling the south wall of the building. That's data that we've just collected without a mechanical wire or device, just getting people to tell us what's going on. And this is the south wall of the building. You would expect there'd be hot reports because of the radiant gain, but we've been receiving no hot reports on that side of the building. So to us, this, we were really looking to prove last year when we started that we could use this human data and create something um, really useful. And I think we've proven that you know, with the network, the human network of things connected with the internet of things, that we can create a breakthrough in comfort energy and hopefully productivity. 
since we went to market, we've been getting lots of big corporations have been asking us for access to this technology. We've been very excited to have such positive feedback and people who are leads to qualify to, you know, a lot of folks coming to us um, unsolicited and folks that are signing up to use it. And we've been asking ourselves what, what's been driving this interest and this adoption. And we, we theorize around, you know, the, today, in today's world with social media, you have all these, uh, this crowdsourced information that's being broadcast about things going on in buildings in a sort of ad hoc way, in a, in a chaotic information flow that for corporations can degrade their brand. It's hard to control the content. Um, and you don't have that direct communication channel. And I think um, there really is a, the opportunity to turn the funnel the right way around and crowdsource the information, deliver it to the folks that actually need to react, and then have this feedback loop where you have a direct communication channel, and then you can gather this historical record and data that can help you make better decisions. So for us, that's, that's the platform you know, concept. I think uh, I'd love to hear more about what everyone here thinks about this. Um, and um, you know, we think we have the opportunity to disrupt and change the way building management is done um, at, the, at the nexus of building, mobile, and human science. And um, I look forward to, to hearing more from all of you about what we're doing. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. all the different geolocation capability technologies um, that are out there and uh, iBeacons are, are one possibility that in the future we'd like to bring in. You know, iBeacons, RFID, Bluetooth, um, all these different technologies either weren't ubiquitous across all mobile devices, they required an integration step that we really didn't feel like we, we needed to do at this point and we, when we really looked at the QR code methodology and I'd spent some time at the Fraunhofer Institute um, to help develop their living lab technology building. We looked at QR code technology for augmented reality. And I, so I knew a bit about that. But that technology is so simple, um, but, but unlocks this, uh, this, this geolocation capability in buildings. And again, it, it, it's, it's ubiquitous across platforms. Um, it doesn't require any batteries. It doesn't require any integration, so. Great. I see we have slides. Eric, appreciate the pinch hit there. Yeah, yeah, That's no great. Problem. Okay, so I already started and got through pretty much this first slide. Buildings, 40% of usage, 30 to 50% of that is routinely wasted. So huge opportunity to save money, um, you know, really impact climate change. The problem is we are not moving as quickly as we need to be or that we should be. Um, Energy efficiency really is the most scalable, cost-effective, and fastest kind of way to reduce this usage. Um, but largely, we are still using a building-by-building -building approach to identifying and evaluating opportunities in buildings. So there really is this information um, asymmetry um, and barrier that exists in the market today where there are many great investment opportunities, but for the large majority of our building stock, the people who are making these decisions um, really don't have access to that information because of this very slow and manual approach. Um, we estimate that it would take about 22 years and cost upwards of $50 billion just to audit every building in the US using traditional approaches with every auditor you know, working around the clock. So really, this truly is not a scalable approach to tackling the problem. So what retroefficiency has done is we have built a platform, um, our building efficiency intelligence platform, which has um, three discrete solutions or applications sitting on top of, uh, sitting within that platform that can be used either together um, or separately, depending on kind of what our customers' needs are. And fundamentally, what that platform does is enable energy efficiency to be driven at a scale and cost never really you know, achievable before by enabling the full life cycle of how a project really happens. So the first is um, targeting the right buildings across a 
large portfolio, um, engaging customers with more specific information about their building, um, helping convert deeper projects by streamlining that, that traditional audit by up to 80%. Um, so the right projects and the most cost-effective projects actually get implemented. And then finally, track for new opportunities, um, both you know, what were the savings of the past, of whatever projects have been implemented, as well as what new things may exist. Fundamentally, our big technology breakthrough is around our ability to create very sophisticated energy models, physics-based energy models of buildings using analytics that really understand how a building like this one is using energy today um, and how it could improve with more efficient operations and systems. And our ability to do this, build these models, which have actually been used in the industry for a very long time, um, but they have just traditionally costed and taken you know, too much expertise to build, is really our big breakthrough in enabling time to insight to enable that process. So just to give you a sense of a real world use case um, of how this, how this would work, you know, say you're a utility, um, many utilities in the US have energy efficiency mandates to save um, with, through efficiency. Um, we, we will work with them as well as energy service providers and large, other large building owners to help drive efficiency through the portfolio. But you can imagine you're a utility um, who traditionally has known very little about their customers other than what they paid on their bill last month and where their actual location is in case they go, need to go fix something. So the first step is to look across that entire portfolio of buildings, you know, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of buildings to figure out which buildings have the greatest potential. We have um, consistently found that about 30% of the buildings in a given customer class account for 70% of that potential. So it becomes very important to understand which buildings to go to first to rationalize your, your resources over you know, such a big, big portfolio. Um, the next step is to you know, give customers very specific information about the opportunities that exist in their building. As I said, traditionally getting that information is just you know, prohibitively expensive, but with platforms like ours and analytics like ours, we really can speed um, and deliver that one-to-one -one message to customers to really impact and get them thinking about the opportunities that exist um, for them and how much they can save. The next step is to really scope out that project. So you've figured out the buildings to go to, you've gotten a group of customers interested, and now you want to figure out, well, what type of lighting technology should we replace the lights in this room with? How exactly should we optimize that HVAC system? We have a, our second application is really built around streamlining that entire process, um, evaluating thousands of measures in minutes, um, energy conservation upgrades in minutes to determine that optimal blend of um, upgrades for a specific building. And then finally, tracking, tracking those savings, both telling people, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lack of confidence in general in the energy efficiency industry that exists. So even, you know, I, I always like to tell the story. Um, two years ago, um, I used uh, Next Step Living, Eric's old company, to insulate my um, 19th century house in Newton. Um, I have no idea, actually, how much energy it saved. I just know that my wife is still complaining that it's cold, so. We also need crowd comfort, but she just tells me directly. Uh, <laughs> and because my utility is not doing a very good job of explaining the value of you know, what they did for me. Likewise, we've, we've collected and created these models. Um, we should use those models as assets. So next year, the price of LEDs may fall 20, 30%. Utility might introduce a new incentive. The building conditions may change. The ability to sort of, with a click of a button, utilize that asset to start that targeting and engagement process, um, again, is another very important piece of our platform and the cycle that we're trying to drive. So retroefficiency, we have been um, around, the company was founded in 2009, officially launched 
in March of 2011. As I said, we're working with a number of large utilities, um, you know, across about 20 different utility programs in the country, as well as large energy service providers like Schneider, Electric, uh, Train, um, as well as government, um, you know, federal, city, state types of customers. Anybody who looks over a large portfolio of buildings is really a good potential um, customer of ours. Pretty proud of the fact that we've evaluated two billion square feet of space since that launch, up from just 25 million in our first year. So we're scaling quite rapidly and have uh, seen some really good adoption. So my last slide is to really leave you with a question. Peter said to uh, you guys would enjoy thinking through some of the business implications of what we're doing. Um, so today we are focused primarily on enabling that utility energy efficiency program. Um, and when you think about you know, what we could do from a platform perspective in the mid to long term, there's, I thought of a couple of different paths. Um, and I would certainly welcome your input um, as to which way we should go or the questions we should be thinking about. But we could, in the, sort of the first option, connect more of the commercial building efficiency value chain, which is really the segment that we primarily play in today. So, you know, we're working with utilities today. There's a whole set of product companies, of financiers to get those products actually funded, um, contractors that work in the field. We could use <clears throat> extend that platform to connect all of those and make that process even more seamless. Secondly is expanding to non-commercial segments, so residential, um, industrial. Can we make a play there? The third is moving a little bit out of energy efficiency and layering on distributed energy types of resources, so solar, storage. Um, and then finally, um, enabling other types of utility grid applications. So we are in this energy efficiency clean tech space in, within the utility, but there's a whole set of applications that the utility uses that are you know, largely siloed today, such as managing their network, figuring out when outages happen, making sure customers are actually paying them. Um, so there are these options, and you know, depending on which path we would go to, um, you know, that might dictate different types and flavors of platform strategies, clo more closed um, versus more open with other um, players helping us and partners helping us grow those solution sets. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. And um, thank you for your time and, and patience with, uh, with my slides. I think we've got uh, time for uh, two questions. So um, as I mentioned, it's a big space. Um, not a lot of platforms, but I think uh, potential. So. so actually, I'll start. Um, so it's interesting that the way you've launched really both of our companies, your platforms. Uh, you started out in the enterprise space, so you've gone to customers who have an immediate need for what you're doing. Um, but it's also the case that I don't interact that much with my utility, except to maybe pay their monthly bill, which is kind of on auto pay. In your context, you're now developing a relationship that is much more frequent, and you have much better data. And you're then able to arc across multiple firms. So you've had a number of firms that really both companies are engaged in. So I guess the real question is, and you may not actually want to answer this in public, but to what degree do your customers fear you um, in the sense that you're really getting much closer to their customers than perhaps they are? And, and what's the tension in, in that that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I, I can. Uh, happy to address that. Um, we we very much try um, and work very hard with to position ourselves with utilities, for example, that we are enabling them rather than trying to be that brand um, to that customer. There certainly have been are other players in our space um, that have you know, worked with utilities and edged closer to being more of that customer-facing brand, and, and it is a threat. I mean, our, our vision is really around enabling those customers. So, um, you know, I, I can say uh, pretty openly that we don't have any grand visions of kind of leapfrogging 
you know, that, that customer. Um, when we're working with utilities, we are able to, at least within that utility, aggregate lots and lots of customers. Um, so, you know, I think that, that helps kind of drive that vision and help us meet our mission of scaling the, the problem. But you should mention where you get your data from. Yeah, and we do get we do get it from the utility. So a big driver, um, yeah, a big driver. I mean, of our of our business and the value that we bring is from the utility, um, and they have been. You know, it comes back to why haven't there been more platforms um, in the energy space? And it really is because of of that data un, being able to unlock that data um, is has been difficult. Um, you know, you can't just go on like as you would to Airbnb with a buyer and a seller and say, hey, I, I have something to rent, I, I want something to buy and connect, it's just not that easy. So that is why fundamentally we really do focus on utilities because they, they have that data. And, uh, should we, okay, just quick and then we'll do another question. Uh, my question is, do they really care about energy savings? You take Con Ed that gives a one cent per square foot for cool roof coating. Nobody deals with Art Rosenfeld's heat island effect group in terms of trying to save energy by doing, you know, legitimate cool roof coatings. Even the Rocky Mountain Institute, and I've read all the papers on cool roof coatings as well, and I happen to own a company in that business. <laughs> um, but it, it doesn't seem like they really care. You really are, don't seem to want to do it on a macro level, like at the heat island effect. The, you know, I know your business is more on a building by building basis than mm -hmm. it appears to be, but I just don't find the utilities really caring about it on a macro level. What are your thoughts? I, I mean, at, at the highest macro level, utility businesses are generally driven by selling electricity and power to you. Um, the reason that today and increasingly they are caring about energy efficiency is um, it's regulatory driven um, for, uh, you know, in a large part, um, obviously in some cases there is a larger thrust to be better environmental stewards. Con Edison is a really interesting example actually um, where we're working with them specifically on constrained areas of their network in Brooklyn where they literally, in two years, will, will not be able to supply power to those customers if they don't use energy efficiency and other demand side resources to reduce that. Um, it's just prohibitively expensive to uh, be digging in the middle of Brooklyn, apparently. Um, so as efficiency becomes um, recognized as a way to um, manage that network um, and you know, regulatory frameworks change, I think you'll see a shift there. Um, but it is mixed across the country in terms of, you know, how much they care. You, you do an end run around that problem and go directly to the companies that care about productivity. Yeah, and, you know, to some extent, you know, we're, we're, there's two sides of our equation, but the paying side is the facilities real estate team. And one of the, you know, the first question, going back to Jeff's original, is, um, you know, are we going to get um, overwhelmed with, like, reports from people? And the reality is we're not creating new issues in the building. We're just creating a quicker way and a better way to gather data and be able to respond to it. Um, on the utility side, you know, as you, as you look at, Ma Massachusetts is the leader in energy efficiency. Um, there's a $2 billion commitment over three years to this energy efficiency equation. That's being driven by people, the, the ratepayers want that in, in, this, in this area of the world. People don't want new power plants in their backyard, so a, a cheaper uh, energy supply is one that you don't, you know, the, the megawatt, the one that you don't consume. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's about eight utilities that, across the country that are really progressive in looking. They understand the climate energy balance. They see the risks to their business long term and are reacting to it. And I think that's going to, you're going to see more and more of that. Mm -hmm. One more? Okay. Any other? Yes, in the back. Uh, I, I was referring to the Gary Hamill book, and one of the cases in there is uh, centered around BP and uh, the gentleman there who was innovative and wanting to move away from petro-based fuels to uh, you know, solar and alternative energy. They also had a similar uh, case, I guess, with between Sony and Nintendo, where they were making uh, chips for, um, you know, they didn't understand why they were doing that and you know, what's, what's the relationship here between gaming and, and Sony. And, 
So a series of sort of um, uh, cases where an internal um, insurrectionist more or less had to, within one of these companies, stand up and say, you know, I'm going to put my life on the line here for this cause. And that's what happened with BP and Gary Hamill's book, if you recall. So I guess my question really is, with respect to the, to the energy industry, do you, see, do you see any activity like that or do you see a need for that type of internal insurrectionism to overcome uh, some of the, I know using the demand side as, as a primary lever to sort of break some of the, the traditional paradigm, but do you see any internal uh, evidence of that type of change within that sector or those energy producers? You know, pre previous to uh, previous question, sort of building on the previous question. Sort of if people within, for example, the utility um, driving that change. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, there, <laughs> there's a lot of great people that we work with every day that, um, you know, within the energy efficiency groups or at the C level that are really help driving that vision. I, I think, uh, to Eric's point, um, there are very big you know, macro trends that uh, the, the so-called the utility death spiral um, that are, whether, you know, whether it's out of the goodness of their heart or, you know, real things that they're seeing coming down the pipe that, that are going to drive that change. And I think that coupled with, um, you know, the regulatory environment, you have the EPAs, um, carbon regulations, um, you know, re utilities generally are still heavily regulated. So it, it's really, I think, both of those things. Um, that will that will largely impact the change in the midterm. What? Okay. So you're suggesting that it's an enforces model, more or less. You've got regulatory pressure, market pressure, the traditional sort of Porter model. Is that what you're suggesting is is unfolding here? Yeah, I mean, there is a confluence of factors. I think that we're seeing kind of progressively, rather than you know one one major moment. So there's a bunch of conditions, but really the question is: is are there are there platform plays in this space that can solve some of these fundamental challenges in, in the energy sector? And I, I hope we've convinced you that they're the beginnings of a, an expansion of these and some innovations that show that you don't have to deck out a whole building with sensors. People can be an interesting source of sensors. And then extracting some of these uh, um, new data analytic techniques to go in, you know, in, in many respects, Mike's um, company reminds me of the healthcare space where we find that um, some of the patients are responsible for a large percentage of the healthcare costs. Well, it turns out there are some energy, you know, there's some assets out there that are responsible for a large percentage of the energy wastage. And so these techniques can come in and uh, provide insight and pinpoint those, uh, bring the parties together that are able to fix them. So with that, thank you very much. And appreciate your coming today. <laughs>